This is 3D Focus TV from Dimension 3 here in Paris. I'm with Steve Sclair, CEO of Reality. You've just done a, a talk, haven't you? So, what, I heard that you've been in uh, Moscow doing something with regard to a Russian film. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, we were over there meeting about... Uh, it's, a, it's a very large project. Um, shooting in Russia, it's not 100% for sure that it's going to be shot in 3D, but it looks like it'll be shot in 3D. And you know, if it does, I think we're going to be doing it. And I'm really excited about it because... I've read a lot of scripts, and it's such a great script. I'm really excited about this project. I love the script. That sounds very intriguing. You're, the company Three Reality is involved with The Hobbit, and you've just wrapped up Spider-Man, is that right? Correct. Can you tell me your involvement with both of those movies? Uh, our involvement with both is similar to some extent. We supply the technology for shooting, uh, and we supply the training. In other words, slight difference between them. On The Hobbit, it's in New Zealand, they're shooting for a year, and they have amazing crews down there, and it's hard for us to supply a crew for a year. So what we did is we've trained their crews, not only how to use the equipment, but a lot about shooting in 3D. And um, we've, we've gone in and out a few times and during the tests, and then we put a crew there during the first few weeks of shooting just to make everything was going well. And uh, it's a great crew, they get it. They're really good with the gear, so they're shooting now. There's none, none of the reality people are down there, and I'm pleased to say they're on schedule. Yeah, I understand that. Was it Spider-Man was only just one day behind schedule, and the 2D... Uh, Spider-Man, yeah, they pretty much wrapped on schedule, so the 3D didn't hold them up. That, that was one of the goals at reality was develop a technology that lets you shoot two, 3D as fast as 2D, because the, biz, the movie and television business needs a better business case for 3D. You can't say that 3D is going to cost so much more. So one of the ways to achieve that is stay on, stay on a 2D schedule. So by not adding days, which is the most expensive thing you could do to a feature, um, it helps a lot to stay on schedule. The additional cost for one or two people or equipment is nothing on a major feature, but additional days are definitely a lot. Uh, you said that The Hobbit's being filmed at 48 frames per second, and yes. I know James Cameron said, you know, we need to look at, at this higher frame rate. Um, I'm interested, a cinema is going to be easily, you know, how difficult will it be for cinemas to adjust to that, and what difference will it make to a 3D film? It's actually fairly simple for a cinema, digital cinema, to play at 48 frames a second. Probably the biggest change, they might have to change out some of the servers, because the servers are, um, you know, that, that'll be the stopping point and a, a different server can achieve those frame rates. Projectors, for the most part, except maybe the ver some of the very early first-gen ones, can all achieve 3D at 48 frames a second. What do you get for it? And have you seen a demo of it? Yes, seen I've it? seen demos of it. So in 2D, there's motion artifacts. You know, you never sh shoot a horizontal panning shot past the picket fence, for instance, because of the strobing. In 3D, those kind of 2D artifacts are actually painful to look at. You know, it hurts to look at that kind of strobing in 3D. Uh, you know, there's a lot of motion artifacts that really become more evident when shooting 3D. So 48 frames a second is just a better temporal resolution. And, you know, if frame rate is part of resolution, it's just higher res. But the motion of objects that are moving fast is a lot smoother. We can now I have no problem doing this, but if I did that that fast with a camera, it would strobe horribly. It would be very uncomfortable to look at, but at 48 frames a second, certainly much less so. The last time I interviewed you, uh, you said that expect episodic 3D content within 18 months. That was in January. Do you still stand by that? Absolutely. I might even say some of it's faster, but we're already working on some, yes. Fascinated to hear that. Are you allowed to say any of the names of no. these episodes? No, 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 okay, no, no, but are you at least able to tell me if any of these things are in the UK? Or is it just in America right now that you were aware I'm of? I'm aware of some in the UK that we're not working on. Okay. So I am aware of some in the UK that are considering starting in 3D. You know, the business case works for episodic right now. You know, a lot, live broadcast is still experimental. There's costs associated that can't be born forever. But there's a business case for episodic today. So it makes sense that they're going to be the first ones to start moving in that direction other than what, say, B Sky B is doing with the live events, which they have found a business model to support.
But I mean, don't want to sound too pessimistic here, but what hard evidence is there that people will be happy to wear glasses in their homes watching episodic content? People will be happy to have the choice to watch 3D at home on episodic content. Just because it comes out in 3D doesn't mean you have to watch it in 3D. You can watch it in 2D or 3D. And a lot of people, especially with the passive monitors, don't have objections to wearing glasses to watching their shows. You know, I don't even want to say big social environments, maybe they would, because, you know, the pubs and clubs that Sky's broadcasting to are large social environments, and everybody wears glasses, yeah. and nobody has a problem with it. And as you say, I mean, the LG Cinema 3D screens, I think, are fantastic. I saw a few of those at MIP, and I was blown away at how, how good that, they were. And that's what's in the pubs and clubs, is the, those glasses. LG screens. Sure. So, um, passive so, screens. Yes. It, you know, passive screens... If there's a social stigma to wearing glasses, certainly the passive glasses are a little easier to get away with because they look no different than our normal eyeglasses or sunglasses. Sure. Okay. Um, just wrapping up now, you said a, talked about a depth adjustment tool in your talk uh, to enable uh, faster cutting in 3D. Can you just give me a bit more information about that? And when's it going to be? Is it released yet? No, it has, it's not released yet. Um, we've got a couple of products that will be coming out in front of that. But yes, one of the tools that we're working on all, all these tools really come from a market need, not from the need, hey, we could build this cool tool, maybe somebody will buy it. We're, we're actually look at the market, what's it going to take to make 3D into a mainstream business, where are the holdups, and then we design tools to solve the bumps in the road between here and ubiquitous 3D television. Mm -hmm. One of the tools that we're building is something that smooths depth across edits. Now, we do this in feature films and anything pre-recorded, you know, there's, there's the urban myth that says, oh, you're shooting 3D, you can't cut fast. Of course you can cut fast. You know, as early as the U2 movie, we had six-frame edits. But what we didn't do was jump the depth every six frames. The depth across that whole sequence of six-frame edits was identical. There were no jumps in depth. So you can cut the content very quickly as long as you don't cut depth quickly. But there's ways to... And every shot has its own depth, so... But there are ways to transition the depth from shot one to shot two. And there's ways to level the depth so it's identical on all, on so all the shots. you can film something at a certain convergence point and your software will you know, reduce that if the previous shot was reduced? It'll level the depth across the edits by changing the convergence points to a common point at the cut point. Okay. And then it'll, let, then it'll shift back to what the stereographer intended that shot to be. These are subtle adjustments and they're very quick. If you take your glasses off, you'll see a little bit of a shifting before and after the edit. Yeah. But if you're wearing glasses, you don't even see it. But it, what you do notice is you don't get a headache. It doesn't make you nauseous to watch a sequence, and it's quite comfortable. And the other piece of software you just spoke about, the auto adjustment, uh, oh, sorry, auto alignment. alignment, that sounds, is that a mechanical process? Though? It's a mechanical process. So the image processor is looking at a 3D picture. You don't need special charts. Just any 3D picture, as long as there's something in the foreground and something in the background. And that's pretty much any, anything you point the camera at, except blue sky will have that. So it and analyzes the lineup between those left and right eye cameras, because they're both looking at the same thing. And it'll realign the cameras so you get a null, a zero, so the image perfectly overlaps. And then it'll adjust the, any shifting that has to happen mechanically as you change the interaxial or convergence or lens length. I don't know human could? Much better than a human could. It takes a human sometimes hours to do a first alignment, build, build the lookup tables. This is five minutes. And it, better than a human, meaning it's a little more accurate than a human. Now, a human working with our image processor is getting the same digital readout, so they'll keep adjusting alignment until that digital readout is zeroes all the way across or as close as you can get it but the computer's just faster getting it there. Finally, um, give me a, a, a wrap-up of what's changed since when did you do U2 3D? That's quite a while ago now, wasn't it? That was a while ago. I think that was three or four years ago. So what, what's been the, the biggest changes from your company's perspective? The newer cam everything. We went in there, with two, the cameras were two generations ago. Mm -hmm. So we aligned them at the beginning of the show, but of course they didn't stay in alignment, especially as we use zoom lenses, we did what everybody else is doing in those days. We found the best zoom range to keep it in alignment. But of course, operators will go past that in a heartbeat unless we set hard limits and we didn't want to. So the camera systems were required a lot of post-production alignment fixing, which we did. Um, the cameras are so much lighter than what we used on YouTube. They're 
incredibly small and light now that you can run around and hand hold them. In that movie, you couldn't really hand hold those cameras. They were a little bit heavy. Yeah, but it, even though it's only it's, well three or four years ago now, it's still a really good example of, of accident 3D. In fact, um, Steve, going back even further than that, Steve was uh, from Digital Domain who were involved with Terminator 2 3D, which is actually the world's most expensive per minute movie of all time, wasn't it? So fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Steve. If you want to watch Steve's full speech, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Also follow on Twitter at 3D Focus Live and sign up to RSS feed on 3dfocus.co.uk. Thank you. Bye.